Uh, welcome to this ISTFA 2020 tutorial. This is actually a short uh, version of a longer version that is typically held uh, live at the ISTFA annual conference. Focus is uh, atomic force microscopy and how it can be used in failure analysis. My name is Peter De Wolf, and I'm the Director of Applications at Bruker uh, Nanosurfaces. So I'll cover um, a short introduction of what AFM is, because some of you might not be familiar with that, before I go into the bulk of the presentation, which is covering the different properties one can typically measure with AFM in the field of failure analysis. So let me get started by a short introduction. An AFM is a high resolution, high spatial resolution microscope technique that is based on the raster scanning of a very sharp probe or needle across that surface of interest, scanning line by line, hence creating 3D images of the surface. Um, when using a very sharp tip, nanometer sized, we can get down to that nanometer uh, spatial resolution. The nice thing is that we can measure surface topography like volume, size, roughness, but at the same time, we can also measure some physical properties. And in failure analysis, often that's where our interest will be. So some typical topography examples here, maybe a little less failure analysis, but still a lot of uh, AFM measurements are, are performed in this way. On the left side, there's a roughness example, um, a gallium nitride wafer that shows uh, terraces as well as dislocations. We can clearly resolve both the terraces, which have very small steps, and the dislocations, which are small pits into the surface, can extract that dislocation densities, etc. Et the middle shows a, a typical 3D measurement where we measure trenches and lines uh, with an interest of doing some critical dimension metrology. Maybe we're interested in the width, the height, uh, maybe even the sidewall slope, or maybe the profile at the bottom. This particular profile at the bottom has a rounded uh, surface uh, feature. Obviously, if we want to reach that type of features, we need to adapt our AFM tip, not only to be sharp um, or very high resolution, but also a long spike so that we can actually enter these trenches. The third example is just illustrating the resolution of the microscope goes down to the atomic scale. This is an atomic lattice of calcite in solution while the calcite is actually dissolving into the solution. As mentioned, topography is only one leg of the AFM application side. The other leg is the property measurements. And there's lots of different properties, uh, and this family keeps growing, that are measured by AFM. In the electrical properties of particular interest in failure analysis, we measure things like conductivity, charges, impedances, piezoelectricity, work functions. But there's also magnetic properties, mechanical properties, thermal properties, maybe the melting point or the temperature distribution, as well as chemical properties one can measure. I'll show some examples as a short session, so I'll, I'll, I won't cover all of them, but I'll do a nice sampling. So let's move into the, the biggest category, which is really that electrical characterization, biggest in failure analysis, uh, at least. So, Couple of examples. First, starting with one of the you know, relatively popular methods is to use that AFM tip to do an electric field uh, measurement, which will be related to charge or voltage distribution. This is one example here where we're looking at an operating device. Um, so voltages are present, and we're measuring that topography, the typical to AFM, and at the same time we measure the electric field emitted by that device. And we see the, the the metal lines that have a voltage applied to them show up as a higher electric field. And when there's a leakage to a grounded uh, area, that shows actually up as in higher electric field as well, identifying a defect area. Second example towards the bottom is a work function or surface potential map on a, on a silicon wafer that is covered by two different metals. Different metals have a different work function, and that's exactly what we extract in that surface potential or KPFM amount um, will measure that pretty accurately. Second commonly mode for electrical characterization is to measure conductivity. 
In order to measure the conductivity, you'll apply a voltage to the backside of the sample and measure the current flowing through a tip. Typical application here is to do this at the contact level where we have, for example, a deep process device where the metal plugs, the tungsten plugs are exposed. There's a large area view here. This is a, a smaller area view of the height. You can see all the bumps which are corresponding to the tungsten plugs. At the same time, we can measure conductivity and we see that different plugs show up with different conductivity. It's actually not the tungsten, but it's the device that is connected to the tungsten that causes these differences. If that device has maybe leakage, short shortage, or maybe high resistive contact, those things will show up in that current map. In addition to the current map, we typically will also position the AFM tip onto several of these tungsten plugs and collect IV spectra to learn more about the device below. Some examples shown here, there's two types of IV curves corresponding to two types of the contact, indicating a difference in resistance in the device below. Second conductivity application here is when we go to dielectrics. When we go to dielectrics, typically the current is a tunnel current rather than a direct current, and we often refer to the mode as tunneling AFM rather than simply conductive AFM. But it's the same mode. Um, again, we measure topography, and here we are imaging an area that has a very thin oxide, but also a thick oxide, and we measure conductivity at the same time. Through the thin oxide, there can be some current flowing. It's tunneling through the oxide. The thick one is too thick, no current flows. In that thin oxide, we see some variations. Those are related to variations in the dielectric thickness or potentially defects located into the dielectric that we can now spot uh, with high resolution in that AFM or tunneling AFM image. Again, one could do some IV spectroscopy as well in selected points. This is an, a couple of IV spectra collected on a three angstrom, so a very thin dielectric, I can see that the, volt, the current starts to flow at relatively low voltages um, and showing a nice repeatability in this particular oxide. A similar application where we again will use a, a sort of a conductivity measurement, applying a voltage to the sample and measure the conductivity or resistance um, is called scanning spreading resistance microscopy. If we do that measurement on a semiconductor, the resistance we're measuring is actually dominated by what is called the spreading resistance. That spreading resistance nicely relates to the carrier concentration in the sample. It's a nice formula that uh, shows that relationship. So if we apply that on a sample with various uh, dopants or carriers in it, alternating N-type and P-type, for example, as in this indium phosphide test structure, for the concentration, maybe um, decreases as we go from left to right here, from uh, 23 to one times E17. As it's decreasing concentration, the measured resistance nicely increases. So it's a direct relation, both for anti, both for p-type. That shows us again when we're doing maps, it shows the 2D distribution of the carriers in that particular device. Here's another example, um, nice, uh, kindly provided by iMac in Belgium, where we use this technique to look at some smaller structures, some thin structures, and look at the carrier concentration or the diffusion within that fin in different positions. For example, this type of images would allow you to compare diffusion through the center of the fin to what, as compared to the one at the edge. Um, the resolution of this method can be as good as a, a single nanometer. There's a couple of modes that are actually used for that carrier profiling as it's really an, an, an important and uh, popular thing to do in failure analysis. The second mode is the scanning capacitance microscopy. So rather than measuring a resistance, we now measure the capacitance between that tip and the sample. The capacitance again relates to the carrier concentration, just a different way to get to similar information. But now actually when we do the capacitance measurements, we use some lock-in technique that provides two signals, a phase and an amplitude. The phase will allow us to identify whether the material is M-type, P-type, or not semiconducting, maybe isolating layers or metallic layers. 
Um, that's what we see in that image, for example. We see two different colors separated by 180 degree phase difference. That is the M type and the P type. And in a third, more noisy region, this is the um, undoped uh, area in this particular device. This one is an implant, actually, that is about 70 nanometer deep. If you look at the amplitude image, the amplitude image will be related to the carrier intensity or the dopant intensity, if you want uh, to deactivate the dopants. We can make, again, sections through all these uh, images and get more information on the specific carrier profile in the direction of choice. Typical failure analysis example is actually uh, to quickly cross-section the device and then look for the presence or non-presence of implants, um, or maybe in this particular example, looking for a short between two doped areas. And we relatively easily detected by these modes is in this particular failed device, these two doped areas are clearly shorted out. There's a third method for doing this carrier profiling, which is based on microwave impedance measurements. So whereas previously we measured ore resistance or capacitance, and now we measure a full impedance. Often we're focusing on the capacitive part of that. Um, and we'll get images similar to the one on the previous uh, mode with the SCM. Again, we have a phase signal that will give us N type and P type. This, in this particular sample, there's two types, of, um, again, two zones available. And then the um, capacitance and actually also the amplitude that is not shown here will relate to the carrier concentration. In this particular sample, this is a staircase dopant profile. The carrier concentration raises as we go from the outside, um, for example, from the left towards the center and then goes back down as we go again to the other opposite side of the sample. Every different color we observe here corresponds to a different dopant concentration. And actually this image nicely illustrates the dynamic range. It goes from 1E15 to about 1E20, as well as the sensitivity. And there are small variations in that information actually detected. In addition to imaging, we very often will do some spectroscopy to learn more about the sample. In that case, we'll position the tip in specific zones, maybe in different doped stairs, and then collect a CV curve. There's about five, six different curves shown here with the different colors. We have a nice S-shaped uh, profile that we can find back in textbooks that correspond to different dopant levels. The higher dope levels is a more flat curve. The lower dope levels shows more variation of capacitance uh, CV curve. In these electrical modes, there is a trend to collect more information. So rather than focusing on one image at one specific condition, we're often trying to collect that image at the, over a range of conditions. And if I go back to, for example, the capacitance method, the condition, the typical condition of interest is a depth, the different voltage applied to the sample. Um, this is exactly what is done here. We refer to that as data queue. Um, here we show two images at two different voltages of two transistors that are side by side and it's, it's collected from the top surface, whereas previous samples were often shown from the cross section. Um, this, on the right side, we see a little movie that steps through all the images that are collected in this data queue when the voltages vary from minus two to two volts. And you can actually see how the carrier distribution changes with that applied voltage. And the Globally, not too many changes are expected, but then in one specific location at specific voltages, and I point to it right now with the pointer, on the right one here, at some voltages, some defects are observed, and that's exactly what we're interested in. This, um, and, and exactly also what is easy to miss when we only use one particular voltage settings. Same approach, same data cube approach is also applied to these other electrical modes that I discussed earlier like the conductor. Comparing the carrier profile methods, um, there's a good reason there's multiple methods. Each one of them has its particular um, advantage and maybe limitation. Uh, dynamic range is very similar. Spatial resolution SSRM is, is um, superior to the other methods. Um, and then, for example, SEM and SMIM also can identify whether it's P-type or N-type, something SSRM or not. A couple of other differences, I won't point to all of it right now. 
uh, that's more material for the, the full version of this tutorial that we did at the last appointment. Just switching back to the microwave method, the microwave method is also used for uh, one other application, and it is to study dielectrics. Actually, it's used for many other applications. It's collecting of interest. In addition to carrier profiling, it's also used to study dielectrics. Um, and often in dielectrics, we could be interested in maybe variations in the dielectric constant, and maybe variations in the thickness of the dielectric, um, or just the, the, the value of the capacitance related to it. And there's three examples shown here that actually illustrate that this method is sensitive to that. The first one here is a stepped surface where there's a different thickness in, in silicon oxide and this s min capacitance image nicely scales with that thickness. Second example actually has metal compacts attached to them, making small spherical capacitors. And the capacitance images that we get scale, the colors that we see here scale with the size and the thickness of the oxide. The third example is where we start to mix different dielectrics or different dielectric constants, maybe subsurface or maybe alternating layers. Uh, so the, the dielectric sandwich is changing like as a result of the measured capacitance and it is reflecting those changes. In this case, we have to use the subsurface. Okay, those were the electrical properties and many more properties we measured. I'll just give one example for each one of the next categories and for a little less frequently used for all of us. Mechanical characteristics. If you use that sharp AFM tip um, and rather than just scanning, if you move it up and down, we can collect what we call a force distance or the number of navigation curve. You can repeat that in every pixel of the image. Out of those type of curves, we can extract mechanical properties. So there's an adhesion, for example, a modulus, sample modulus, a deformation, how much do we deform the sample, the dissipation, and some other things. Here's one example where we measure, as, as usual, we always measure the height and the dissipation on a wafer surface that is partially covered. Um, actually, it's, it's post lubricant uh, application, obviously. The roughness of the wafer is extremely smooth. We can actually measure that and extract. It's less than a nanometer scale here. And the dissipation image, as well as the adhesion image, not shown here, shows a very strong contrast based upon the different chemical finish and the different um, the presence or non presence of lubricant or molecules on the surface. Uh, that is still present on the sample, things that are not necessarily reflected in the height image. It could be really nice to identify you know, chemical residues, for example. Second example for mechanical measurements is actually where we combine this with some of the earlier mentioned electrical measurements, because often one property doesn't answer the, um, the question. Here we, we measure the surface potential of the work function distribution, and there's about two colors corresponding the thin and the lead in the solar alloy that corresponds to the two work functions there. And we measure that adhesion between the ASM tip and the sample at the same time. Let's see in the adhesion of this in incremental information to the potential image. And obviously, we also have the high image. Going to the next category, which is the thermal characterization. If we change the tip with a little bit of a, a special call it an active tip. An active in a sense that there's a small resistor built into the tip. And if this tip is exposed to a different temperature, that resistance will change, which will be our method, a very high resolution method to detect uh, temperature and map, make temperature maps. That type of tip, we can do um, experiments like, like the following. Uh, here's an image measured on a uh, cross section of an Edge emitting laser. So the active area is here, and the bright spot is the hot spot, is where the edge emitting laser is actively emitting. The black area is the substrate where it still remains cold and is also connected to the heat sink. So we have the temperature map again with the typical AFM resolution of that device. So now we can crank up the power applied to that laser 
and do this again and measure how that temperature varies with power. And we can map that spectrum, temperature spectrum, in any of the positions in this image. So get some more information on the thermal characteristics of the particular devices. Final property measurements are chemical property measurements. And this is a, a field that is growing strongly the last few years. The first way to combine an air fund of chemical identification is to combine with, uh, with Brahman. There's a couple of ways of doing it. We just touch upon one is when we have an AF fund, um, we can do all these property measurements we, we went through earlier. For example, we can do a height measurement and a work function measurements. This is on a graphene sample with single multi-layered uh, graphene layers. The work function actually scales with the, the amount of layers of the graphene. So we can do an AFM measurement and then we can navigate very precisely so that the Raman system, that's a gift shows the integrated system, but the Raman system can measure the exact same area. Maybe the G band, for example, the D band analysis problem and carbon-based materials on this uh, graphene sample as well, allowing a, a perfect Correlation. Of course, the resolution of the AF family is known from the and related to the specific AF mode we operated. The resolution for the Raman is diffraction limited, um, confocal Raman, diffraction limited. Second chemical identification method we can correlate to is AFM um, IR is IR spectroscopy. This allows one to do both. Um, IR mapping with AFM resolution as well as um, IR spectroscopy while positioning the tip with its typical AFM uh, resolution. But, uh, two examples shown here. First on the mapping side, uh, here is um, a, a polystyrene PMMA blend um, that is used for um, DSA lithography, direct self assembly lithography. Here's the height image obtained by AFM, and here are two images obtained at two different wave numbers. Um, basically, the IR absorption. We can, we can also position the, the AFM tip in the two different materials we see, because clearly there's two different materials, the polystyrene and the PMMA, and then collect a spectrum that is actually coming from a 10 nanometer spot um, over a wide wave number range. IR spectra are very similar to one one would get with a more macroscopic FTIR method. This, of course, allows to chemically identify what kind of material we have. Here is one of these identification examples where we're looking at the contaminant. This in the AFM topography image is not so much visible. We see here there's a little bit higher area. This is a contaminant. We can position the tip there, collect one of the IR spectrum which is the red spectrum shown here. You can also go to some reference point, collect the blue spectrum, it's clearly a different chemistry. Then we can go to our FTIR da database, um, and in the same way as we would analyze an FTIR spectrum, analyze this AFM IR spectrum, and then identify that this contaminant spectrum actually corresponds to this particular material in the light of it. Just to finish, a few practical aspects um, related to these measurements. Very often when we do these measurements, we need access to the area of interest. Most of these methods measure what's exactly below the tip and not what's further below, not subsurface, but really surface techniques. So we need to expose the area of interest. Um, often that involves some etching steps if you try to do it from the top surface, or maybe some cross-sectioning uh, if you do need some cross-section samples. Different cross-section methods like polishing, cleaving, focused ion beam are all valid candidates, but there's a couple of things one needs to pay attention to. In particular, when we use focused ion beam, um, the, uh, this technique can induce some doping artifacts, some, basically some redistribution of the doping concentration we're trying to measure often um, and so we need to be careful about that. Often this 
translates into the requirement in the final polish, polishing steps to remove that modified layer of the focus time. It requires a little bit of um, um, how to know uh, and, and careful handling, but definitely possible. Second thing is that when we do polishing, often we are okay in using a lot of surface charges. Um, and surface charges can obviously also come from other sources, but polishing is a typical uh, uh, reason for it. There's a, a simple trick to get uh, those reused is to do some UV treatment at the specific um, time, temperature, profile, um, and intensity. Um, this will remove the majority of the, those surface charges. An example is shown here. This is a capacitance image just after polish, so the surface charge is present and it's the exact same sample, same operating conditions. But now it went through that post polish UV treatment and it cleaned up the contrast to a much stronger between N type and P type region in this, uh, in this memory cell. Second practical aspect, and then I'll finish after this, is the probe selection. Every mode I went through has this family of modes that are well suited to do that particular measurement. Um, I only show one here, because very often we're interested in high resolution electrical measurements on samples that are relatively hard and it could wear out that sharp tip. Um, this is a nice tip for those applications because it has tip size down to a few nanometers is made out of diamond, highly doped diamonds, nicely conductive, sufficient for all the electrical measurement, but also very robust so it can handle the harder sample types that we often have to deal with. So just one of the tips, there's many other ones, uh, metal tips, metal coated tips, etc. cetera, the as well. So um, this is in summary, I think AFM is uh, a lot more than just a 3D microscope for photography. There's, I tried to show a number of properties one can measure with it in simultaneous 3D photography, both electrical, mechanical, thermal, and chemical properties. And we'll find AFM back in, in many different areas in failure analysis. Uh, we can, for example, measure conductivity, carrier concentrations, dielectric properties such as thickness um, and, di and dielectric constant uh, uniformity, do some hotspot imaging. Subsurface detection is possible through the impedance method. And when we have defects or contamination, we can also identify maybe some of the chemical modes, what those defects um, or contaminants are. And then the mechanical modes also allow us to uh, to identify some mechanical thing. So thank you for your attention. If you're interested in more of this, I, um, I invite you to join the live ISTA conference, where obviously we have a bit more time to go into more detail. We can also address uh, many questions. Thank you so much.